From every mountain and valley the world over are flowers and plants of simple beauty. Some hold a natural wonder, chemicals that soothe pain and inspire euphoria. At times they've been hailed as a gift of heaven, but in the last century they've been condemned as a scourge of man. Once, marijuana, cocaine, opium, ecstasy, LSD, even heroin were perfectly legal. Today, they compel a war on drugs. Did these plants and drugs change, or did we? Drugs are menacing our society. It's like a five-hour orgasm. Used wisely can produce the greatest ecstasy that man knows. Every generation's youth have danced the night away, from the jitterbug to the twist. Part of the adventure of the youthful rite of passage often involves the use of illegal drugs, from spiked punch to marijuana and LSD. At the start of a new century, adolescents are flocking to a new illegal drug called ecstasy, sold and distributed at raves, dance parties that grew out of the culture of the drug and fostered its popularity. But my favorite drug in the whole entire world is ecstasy. Imagine if you just won $100 million in the lottery, and everyone around you has also won $100 million in the lottery. That's what it feels like to be on ecstasy, where you feel this great high, you feel everyone else is also high, everyone else is just great, you feel close to other people. Oh, it's like a five-hour orgasm. This is not about, like, opium where you want to go zone out and, and drop out. It's not that kind of escape. It's not let me drop out of the world and do nothing. It's let me have excitement. Let me do something wild and different. Let me enjoy this because I want to be awake and do it. I want to run around and get involved. Right on, man. Adolescents throughout history have used illegal drugs in rebelling against the prevailing social values of the day. If you look at the late 60s, drugs like LSD and psychedelics were quite popular. And I think then people were responding to the oppressiveness of America in the 1950s and the early 60s and really seeking sources of expression, really seeking to create an alternative universe, if you will. Just as LSD, marijuana, and Woodstock unite a generation, experts say ecstasy and the rave scene act as a glue for millions of savvy middle-class kids seeking an escape from the isolation, alienation, and loneliness of the modern day. For $25 to $40 a pill, ecstasy users can purchase an increased sense of intimacy. They call it the love drug, and it's not really about that at these crowds. It's not about sex. It's about family and being close and being together. That sense of emotional well-being is nothing more than a chemical reaction inside the brain. Ecstasy stimulates the discharge of serotonin, which affects mood, energy, and emotion. Normally what happens, a little bit of serotonin gets released at a time. And in fact, uh, antidepressants such as Prozac and uh, Zoloft and Paxil also act on serotonin. What ecstasy basically does is it takes serotonin uh, and releases it all at once. And the next nerve gets all the serotonin and just goes berserk, basically. Intimacy, empathy, openness. The chemical compound that inspires these feelings is methylene dioxymethamphetamine, or MDMA. Though not physically addictive, it could cause psychological dependence. An average 100 milligram dose lasts between six to 10 hours. The chemical precursor to the party drug of the 90s is patented by German pharmaceutical giant Merck. 
when Merck patented it, it was just uh, one of a number of drugs, just that they thought may have other drugs that could be developed from it at some point in the future that might have effects on the brain. But this is World War I, and the Germans must focus on drugs for the war effort. With Germany's defeat, MDMA and every other patented drug is turned over to the Allies as a spoil of war. Its existence is lost from memory until the Cold War compels the Pentagon to re-examine its potential for national defense. In 1953, the U.S. Army began to experiment with ecstasy in animals, dogs, guinea pigs, monkeys, to see whether it might have use in chemical warfare. Again, the drug was then dropped for a while. The love drug does nothing of use for war, but the compound still exists. Now, realize at that time, the chemical had been synthesized, uh, but it had not been produced into a pharmaceutical product. So it existed in the books. Someone could look it up and make it, synthesize it, but no company was producing it because it had no medicinal use. No known use. But what if the drug's empathic qualities could transform the way people relate to each other? In 1977, Alexander Shulgin, a medicinal chemist in California, synthesizes the compound and introduces it to local psychotherapists. Psychotherapists in the 70s and 80s really latched onto this. It was not illegal then. It was just a, a chemical substance that existed in society. Uh, and a lot of psychotherapists, particularly out in the West, uh, used this in, a, in very valuable uh, sessions to, to help their patients. And apparently, at least from the anecdotal information, uh, it was very, very successful. Often it was used in marriage counseling and marriage therapy, in which members of a couple would have trouble talking to each other, and ecstasy made them feel close to each other, made them trust each other more, and so therapists began to use it and advocate its use. In the psychotherapeutic community, MDMA is called empathy. Its effect is likened to a year of therapy in six hours. Had MDMA not strayed from that community and that use, it might have remained legal, but beyond the therapist's office, it becomes wildly popular. And that is the beginning of the end for the legal use of ecstasy. What ecstasy does for me is basically every breath I take, I, it, makes my, it makes my teeth chatter, my eyes flutter, I mean, I'm just like, oh, in the late 70s, empathy becomes ecstasy when it jumps from the therapist's office to the party scene. A therapeutic user in Texas sees its recreational potential and arranges for a local chemist to make it, then markets it to local bars. So they would go into clubs in Dallas and Austin, elsewhere in Texas, and have ecstasy nights or have ecstasy bars or ecstasy clubs, and you can buy it over the counter in a paper cup, and it was legal. In some bars, it outsells alcohol, but its excessive, unsupervised use outside of a clinical setting becomes its downfall. There were a lot of incidents where young people were uh, overdosing. Um, there were a couple of deaths, but it's still arguable as to whether it was caused by ecstasy or not. And just the general sense of use, that more and more people are using it in this party scene and having a good time. But having a good time is the result of serotonin flooding the brain. And that dramatic release is what makes ecstasy potentially dangerous. The problem is that cells, when they dump all that serotonin, then often uh, degenerate. Parts of the cells die, and when they grow back, they grow back more haphazardly. You may be interfering with memory, you may be interfering with depression, you may be interfering with a whole host of things that are important in normal functioning. The agony begins when the ecstasy wears off. After a night of partying and a day to sleep it off, the brain is left with very little serotonin. A weekend of ecstasy can result in a phenomenon called Suicide Tuesday, as described in the diary of this 19-year-old female. At this moment, I found myself crashing. Things are really hitting and hurting me now. And I'm scared to death. I find myself so depressed. 
I can't escape this sadness, this need to live in a false reality. I feel so empty. But when I'm on E, I feel so incredible. More can go wrong than just feeling blue. Overstimulated, overheated, and feeling too good to notice, a small number of ecstasy users have literally danced themselves to death. It opens the door to dehydration. If you don't hydrate and drink enough water constantly during this time, body temperature soars up to 107, your brain fries, literally, and they die. In 1982, Texas Senator Lloyd Benson brings awareness of excessive ecstasy use to Washington and the Drug Enforcement Agency. Under the authority of the 1970 Controlled Substances Act, Ecstasy is immediately placed on an emergency ban. Overnight, the drug becomes illegal. Possession is a crime. Under this law, the emergency ban expires two years later. And so in 1984, the DEA began a series of hearings to see whether the drug should be illegal or not and how it should be made illegal. At the hearings, the key question is this. Can ecstasy be used medicinally, or should it be banned outright? Supporters of the drug believe it could be beneficial, but would like to research it further. The health I think the DEA in some ways was surprised that suddenly therapists came forth and saying, well, in fact, that they're using the drug and that it is, in their minds, a useful tool in therapy. Uh, what came to be an issue was what the definition of medical acceptable use is. And on the one hand, you had therapists saying they were using the drug and that it was useful. On the other hand, you had scientists saying, well, but it's not meeting the definition of being scientifically proven to be useful. And society. This is Advocates argue to keep the drug legal for two reasons. First, they believe it is useful in therapy. Second, making it illegal would ban all future research. Without research, there can be no study of the drug's effects. Opponents believe the drug is dangerous and ironically cite the lack of MDMA research to justify a ban. After an official finding, the Drug Enforcement Administration overrules the judge. The administrative law judge that was overseeing the hearings that were held to determine if ecstasy should be made illegal, or MDMA, um, didn't think it should be. And he was overruled by the federal government, and it was banned. We've got the transcripts. He couldn't find any reason, why, and it was a Schedule One. When the government categorizes the drug as Schedule One, it is judged to have a, quote, high potential for abuse and no medical use. As a Schedule One drug, ecstasy is outlawed from further testing. This is the first time a specific act of Congress is not required to make a drug illegal. In the early part of the 20th century, heroin, cocaine, and marijuana are legal drugs, too. In spite of their dangers, Congress is unable to ban them because that is seen as a violation of the Constitution's assignment of police powers to individual states. But that changes when a fearful public demands Congress to act. They do, basing the first federal drug laws on taxation. By 1984, when ecstasy is banned, society's attitude towards drugs and the Constitution has changed. The key thing to watch in drug use is where is the middle class? If the middle class is deep into drug use, you'll find that the laws are not so severe. If the middle class is out of it, can't understand why anyone would take drugs, the laws are gonna get very severe against those who do use it. So how is ecstasy banned without an act of Congress? The answer belongs to a modern policy that emerges out of another drug in another time, LSD. The drug that some believe will change the consciousness of America does more to change American drug laws and the way legal drugs become illegal.
1968, the summer of love, LSD use is at its height. Within two years, possession of this innocent looking sugar cube will land a user in jail for up to 20 years. All because a Swiss chemist, 30 years earlier, chooses to look at things a little differently. 1938. The Swiss chemist Albert Hoffmann is on the hunt for a drug he hopes will energize the human circulatory system. Experimenting with ergot, a mold that grows on rye, Hoffmann discovers a substance that will someday shock the status quo of a nation, LSD. His 25th extraction was lysergic acid diethylamide number 25. He accidentally gets exposed to it during the extraction process. He suffers the ergot poisoning that people suffered for centuries before him. But instead of saying, this stuff is horrible, this is scary, this is bad, he's the first guy who says, that was interesting. 20 years later, the Cold War changes the destiny of LSD. In a world preoccupied with fears of nuclear annihilation, the stakes get higher in the game of spy versus spy. The Soviet Union's espionage tactics are a threat to American security and must be thwarted. As the U.S. Army tests MDMA, the CIA tests LSD as a potential Cold War weapon. Somebody in the higher up of the CIA wrote to uh, the people who were going to do this that their ideal drug was a, a, a drug which would cause you to uh, forget all the secrets you had learned, but um, otherwise you'd be completely normal. But LSD does not work the way the CIA had hoped. There were people who had uh, taken it and had had uh, very severe psychotic reactions. In some cases, it probably precipitated or was a straw that broke the camel's back in creating schizophrenia, and they never came back. One man's schizophrenia is another man's enlightenment. A decade later, Timothy Leary, a Harvard researcher, champions LSD as the greatest hope for humankind's happiness. LSD used wisely can produce the greatest ecstasy that man knows, the ecstasy of revelation, seeing that there's more. Leary's message falls on the ears of a new generation disillusioned with the values of the past and eager for something new. Of course it's a whole different way of life, it's a whole different way of living. But more than that, it's a whole different way of thinking. Would you like to take a walk with me? through homes in the Hay Ashbury area and to all these people that are brilliantly exploring their inner consciousness. Leary's prescription for happiness is based on a drug that alters sensory perception, but it is more like a short circuit in the brain. In terms of the switchboard of the body, every nerve in your body communicates with other nerves through certain chemical messages. There are places on the nerves to accept these messages, and there are places on the nerves that send these messages. Normally, in a communication switchboard, Bill can talk to Fred. But when you take LSD, Bill gets plugged into Fred, Betty, Sue, Rex, his dog, the local tree, the moon, 18 memories from the past, imagination from the future, all are plugged in at the same time. So that you look at something and you hear a sound. You hear something and you get a taste. What happens is the ordinary becomes extraordinary because of the disorganization of the brain function. And so uh, reality becomes very interesting. You can be fascinated by a dripping faucet, for example, or uh, a fabric pattern on a sofa. Uh, can, you can watch that for four hours. Some see LSD's effect as mind expanding. Others call it dangerous, even stupid. In any event, a generation flocks to the drug. For some, it alters perceptions to the extent that it changes behavior. I can tell you, in one day, I went from being a math major uh, with a minor in Chinese language to the next day I wanted to stand and hug trees. And I mean literally, 
I was a barefoot hippie overnight. Leary was just selling ideas. Uh, he wasn't selling drugs, and he was going to change the world by getting people to use hallucinogens. It's always been done. What's going on in the United States today is a revolution in consciousness facilitated by these psychedelic chemicals. Leary's attempt to start a revolution in consciousness in the 60s leads to an explosion in the use of hallucinogens. But the trouble is, LSD is... People don't remember that the first drug uh, in the drug epidemic was not heroin and not cocaine. It wasn't even marijuana. The first drug in the modern drug epidemic was hallucinogens. LSD's impact on the nation becomes even more profound as unprecedented population growth creates a record number of users. We had the uh, baby boom generation uh, entering the uh, uh, late adolescence, which is exactly the time that all drug habits begin. And when the baby boom hit that 16, 17, 18 age group, uh, the, uh, the, the culture changed in a very profound way, and we, uh, the, the concept of youth culture became synonymous with drug culture. Unlike opium or heroin, which move from medicinal to recreational use, LSD is strictly a recreational drug, one that is identified with an entire generation. LSD is really very different. Uh, it, it, when, when LSD was first given to drug addicts and they were asked whether they liked the drug, they said no, they didn't like the drug. I don't think anybody uses cocaine or heroin to expand their consciousness, but people will take LSD and, and the other hallucinogens as part of a, a journey uh, of self-discovery, and that's very different. LSD has an effect on the nation that no other drug has ever had. The experience of LSD shapes art and music with images and sounds derived from the way it alters the brain's perceptions. More than a drug, it is a symbol, an emblem of a generation that doesn't trust anyone over 30. LSD is the drug in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There was a revolt, you know, the, you might call it the bohemianization of, of young people. LSD, though perfectly legal, will soon be banned. That will happen as the drug is linked to the rebellious behavior of youth in the 60s. We had the most potent psychoactive drug on the planet being directly marketed to our youth, um, and they were very interested in it. And the results of their taking it were causing a disintegrating effect in society. But its journey to an outlawed substance will get a push from another drug and a totally different drug user. Every illicit drug starts off perfectly legal, freely used, and widely accepted. Many are even hailed at their discovery as medicinal miracles. LSD is no exception. When it is introduced to pop culture in the 60s, it is everywhere and readily available. And LSD had even been advertised in the backs of magazines. You could buy it through the mail, and many famous people did and, and took it in the early years. Uh, the more LSD is used, the more its dangers emerge. 
But while the physiological effects are quite unspectacular, the effects on the mind are explosively disruptive. The reaction to the drug is completely unpredictable. It can be the hoped-for heaven or a hell full of horror. And there are The drug leaves its mark in phrases that become a part of the language of the day. Bummer, flashback, and bad trip. There is no sure antidote for a bad trip. Although People, uh, when their states of consciousness are altered, have a false sense of reality. Some people feel they are omnipotent. Some people feel they can fly. Some people are so disconnected, uh, may engage in activities they would normally not engage with and be totally embarrassed or upset once they came back to their senses. Unfortunately, these dreamy psychedelic trips are very often one way. They weren't ready for it. They didn't understand what was happening to their mind. Post-LSD reaction is a very depressing reaction. People, brain chemistry is so used up that they go into a funk. They go into tremendous morose feelings, and, and they can become suicidal. LSD's potential for personal harm makes headlines. Ironically, the coverage about its dangers intended to deter its use actually encourages it, spurring the epidemic. The media began to have big scare campaigns against these drugs, and the scare campaigns got kids interested in the drugs, and they began taking them. The big rise in drug use among kids followed the media campaigns rather than preceded it. Anti-LSD educational films begin to appear nationwide. Transportation of the fantastic and frightening territory of inner space, courtesy of LSD-25. We are about to take you into the world of the LSD user. A world that to him is real, yet as terrifying and unreal as anything ever imagined. We call his trip of terror to fly a giant bird. LSD's dangers, whether disseminated as scary hyperbole or scientific fact, weigh heavily in the national debate about whether or not to ban it. To lawmakers on Capitol Hill, there is a perceived link between LSD and social anarchy, which threatens the very fabric of society, making its use as dangerous to the country as heroin or opium. They see it as a catalyst or a simple-minded, well, if we keep marijuana and psychedelic drugs out of circulation, we'll never have that kind of trouble again. Before things settle down, 400 If we get into a Vietnam War, there won't be lots of people out there protesting. If we, uh, you know, the civil rights movement, all the things that, uh, the, the free speech movement, I think all those things uh, were connected with marijuana and psychedelics. And of course, it's not causal, but I think in the minds of a lot of these people, that's, that's what made the difference here. And at Kent State in Ohio, four students are killed. The turmoil of the 60s connects LSD to radicals and other subversives. Soon, groups associated with LSD and the drug itself become demonized, a prerequisite for the criminalization of drugs throughout history. The mob's mood, unruly. The next step in LSD's transformation into an illegal drug is the election of Richard Nixon, America's law and order president. President Richard Nixon saw a political opportunity to attack the counterculture uh, kids whose signature was often uh, smoking marijuana and doing drugs. And uh, these uh, people were, were really putting a lot of pressure on Nixon and, and the war. And the country was divided. An American flag is burned at the height of the demonstration. Politically, Nixon needs to quiet the voices of protest that are rocking the nation. Speaking out against the government is legal. Public demonstrations are legal. Recreational drug use is not. Meanwhile, the nation's top cop, FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover, sends an official memo stating, since the use of marijuana and other narcotics is widespread among members of the new left, you should be alert to opportunities to have them arrested by local authorities on drug charges. In a time of grave social upheaval, the president declares a war on drugs. The issue, 
we must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. Nixon begins by throwing out the old system of taxing drugs out of existence, making them unattainable to most users. Prior to that, a drug was illegal when you passed a specific law against it, like the Marijuana Tax Act, uh, the Harrison Act, uh, national prohibition. But the 1970 Comprehensive Drug Abuse Act introduced scheduling. Scheduling categorizes drugs by their perceived danger versus their proven or perceived medical benefits. Schedule I drugs are drugs that are thought to have no legitimate medical value and therefore are absolutely prohibited except in rare cases of research. Schedule I, they put uh, heroin and strangely enough, marijuana, LSD, number of other drugs. LSD fills a generation's prescription for social change. That relationship will also affect how all drugs from that point on are made illegal. You can move a drug from one schedule to another you see how much easier that is than uh, having to pass a new law every time you change your mind about something. I can well understand that legislators would want to include LSD in the class of narcotics, basically, saying that it should be made illegal in the same way that addictive drugs such as um, heroin uh, and other drugs would be illegal. Actually, it's not the same kind of drug, but it was producing a similar destructive social effect. Years later, Ecstasy is put on Schedule 1, limiting any potential research on the drug. The drugs of a rebellious generation are now under federal jurisdiction, just like deadly narcotics. With the Controlled Substance Act, Congress will never have to pass a law to ban a drug again. The President's plan begins to make progress toward reality. Drug arrests are doubled. Three times as much heroin is seized. Nixon's war on drugs removes regulation from the democratic process. That task is now up to the Food and Drug Administration. Meanwhile, Nixon creates the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, whose yearly budget increases over 30 years to nearly $18 billion. With that money, the DEA wages what has become the longest war in American history, a war that has yet to be won. This is one area where we cannot have budget cuts. The war goes beyond law enforcement. Treatment programs banned under the first drug laws of the century are reinstated. Acid baby, the stuff dreams are made of. LSD, like its predecessors, goes LSD? underground. What happened was it lost its uh, public uh, image so that you didn't see it in the newspapers. It didn't light up the television screens. So the, the dramatic change had to do with the public attention, much more so than the, than the levels of use. It's, it's never gone away. It's been a, a mainstay of the youth drug scene uh, since the late 1960s, and it is today. Illegal drugs have been likened to weeds. They're never completely eradicated. At the start of a new century, new drugs appear, never before seen, that pose yet another threat to a generation of kids on the brink of adulthood. Hands above your heads! Hands above your heads! Put your hands on top of your head. Nixon's plan to stamp out illegal drugs initiates a prohibition based on the belief that no one has a right to take a drug proven or perceived to be dangerous. You'll not be hurt, just cooperate, okay? The constitutional right to pursue chemical happiness in place a century before has vanished. Are you searching? Are you carrying any weapons? No, sir. Okay. Yet what the government does to protect its own citizens is often criticized. Spread your legs out a little. If you sum it up and you look at the drug war, number one, it uh, hasn't reduced the production of drugs in the source countries. And number two, even if it did, the synthetic uh, drugs that are made here are just as dangerous. We, we would still have uh, a similar drug problem.
Uh, number three, 90% of the drugs come into the country undetected because of the vast trade that we have. And it hasn't stopped drug use and drug selling. It has been a, a disaster even worse than alcohol prohibition. What it's done to the criminal justice system is indescribable. Half the people, more than half the people in federal prison are there for drug offenses. Where's he gonna go? We're arresting half a million people a year for possessing marijuana. We're locking up kids sometimes for life for their first drug offense. We have no room in our prisons for rapists and child molesters and murderers because we're filling them up with these uh, nonviolent drug offenders. Well, in a frivolous While the war against drugs is a burden and expense that some critics question, everyone agrees something must be done. But first of all, the supplemental that we're considering today is about our children and whether we want our children to grow up in a society free from the scourge of drugs. Meanwhile, for a new generation of sophisticated national and international drug traffickers, it's business as usual. They make untold billions selling drugs, which tempt adolescents and adults every day, despite the best efforts of law enforcement to stop them. This is solely a way of making money and looking at the young people in the United States as the guinea pigs to make the money from. These organizations are committed to bring drugs into the country and we have to be just as committed, not only in law enforcement, but as a society. You know, we're working with parents, we're working with teachers, working with educators to get that message out. The drugs are bad. To make matters worse, some of the new synthetic drugs are potentially more dangerous than their predecessors. In light of this danger, many have been added to the schedules of federally controlled substances. Among them, ketamine, or Special K, a powerful veterinary tranquilizer, and gamma-hydroxybutyrate, or GHB. GHB, a workout tonic used by bodybuilders finds its way into clubs as a dangerous pastime. It's easy to make, and for law enforcement, hard to detect. It looks like water and is sold in containers that disguise its danger. The primary ingredients are, are paint stripper, floor stripper, um, degreasing solvents. My reaction to it was, my God, this is the most dangerous drug I've encountered in 25 years as a cop. And I say that with all my heart. You can die very simply by just forgetting to breathe. You can die from pulmonary edema, which is left heart valve failure, and you literally froth blood through the nose and you drown in your own vomit. You can die face down in a pillow because you're only breathing six times a minute. If you're sitting in a bathtub and you hit a GHB coma, it's called carpeting out, um, you just slide down into the water and drown without even a whimper. Like opium in the 18th and 19th century, GHB has been used to rob and even rape unsuspecting victims. Because it induced the comatose state in a stupor state, people started giving it to strangers and then abused them and misused them. So it became uh, a drug that you use to uh, make a person vulnerable to your advances and uh, unable to resist your advances. It's a nightmare for prosecution and it's a nightmare for drug detection. This drug is only in the system a very short time. And we're seeing a lot of young people's lives ripped apart, or people of all ages, by drug facilitated rapes, GHB being one of the ultimate nightmares. The use of illegal drugs, whether heroin in 1920, cocaine in 1970, or ecstasy in 2000, share a common history. The user increases the dosage or uses drugs that are impure or too strong, the more apparent the dangers become. There is no such thing as good drugs and bad drugs. All drugs are essentially poisons. Some poisons have a short-term beneficial effect. It's the dose that you take that depends on the effect it creates on you. 
But you take a little bit and it's a stimulant. You take more of it and it is a depressant or it has a sedative effect. You take even more, almost any drug, if you take enough of it, will kill you. You squeeze a couple bottles of aspirin down into one tablet and take that tablet and it'll kill you. And yet one of them will simply cure a headache. Drugs don't change anything but the relationship between chemicals already in the body. Yet Americans seem to attribute magical powers to drugs, whether they're used to cure a headache, rid the mind of psychic pain, or induce spiritual enlightenment. But drugs are often taken or advocated as shortcuts to something we all want, but we need this help to get to it. During the time of drug toleration and enthusiasm for drugs, the thought is, if you're careful and you use it just right, uh, the drugs can make you more than you would be just by yourself. There is a physiological naivete about drugs that were going to do one wonderful thing but have no other side effects. When we turn against drugs, the opposite attitude is the one we hold, which is any drug you take reduces your potential. The story of these drug episodes, these waves of drug use, basically is, is the story of how the naivete changes into practical experience with drugs. Over Some say drugs haven't changed, but over time, our attitude the towards them of which is has. Ten times. Drugs are menacing our society. They're threatening our values and undercutting our institutions. They're killing our children. Every president since 1970 has found that the basic human need to use illegal drugs doesn't go away, no matter what the government does. Said no to drugs. The scourge of drugs must be stopped. As long as there is a demand, there will be a supply. Billion dollars. Unless humankind comes up with a cure for the need to escape what is, most of us are bound to ride the wave of desire for a different reality. The question is, can we do it responsibly? kills hundreds of young virgins and bathes in their blood. A teenager from Kentucky brutally murders his girlfriend's parents and drinks their blood. From the castles of Transylvania to the clubs of New York City, it's a mythology thousands of years in the making. Vampire Secrets, next on the History Channel.